AC, uh, I've been going through my own horror film journey. Um, <laughs> the horror of trying to talk about films using StreamYard, which has been very glitchy lately, which is why we're doing Zoom, dusting off the old Zoom account. Wonderful. And then trying to trying to talk about uh, Saw X. Um, so, yeah. Would I, you like to play a game? Um, I, I feel like my internet has been playing games <laughs> with me the last month and a half or so. But, uh, yeah, we're going to get through this. We're going to muscle on through. We're going to prove ourselves worthy of getting out of this death trap. That's right. That's um, right. You got to really want it, though. I don't really want to talk about Saw <laughs> X, though. That's the problem. It's like an 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, somebody I, told me that it was getting really good reviews. I haven't read anything yet, but I was like, really? I'm 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 a little surprised by that. I mean, you and I have our little Saw journey together in that we we revisited the first seven of them. I guess it was, a uh, when was that? It was uh, 2017? Something like that. Yeah, we did a big because we were doing review. the it was the ten year anniversary of the last one, the final chapter. Oh yeah, that's right. And then we also talked about Spiral from the Book of Saw. But correct, you, you told me that I knew. I know I talked about Jigsaw with someone, and right. whoever that is, I freak. My memory is Swiss cheese. <laughs> I know it wasn't you, but we do right. have a show on it. Yep. Um, so yeah, we've talked about all of them. So it seems only fitting to talk about this one, which I mistakenly thought that 2023 was the anniversary, the 20 year anniversary of Saw. It turns out that's next year. So right. I, I, you know, unfortunately, because this movie is doing very well, we might have a Saw 11 for the 20th anniversary. Maybe, maybe. I am so over this franchise. And it, what hurts is that I was with this movie for the first like 45 minutes mm. but it's two hours long and that's way too long and i have a feeling as i teased coming out of the theater with you yes we saw this in person in the theater together how about Reunited it at last yeah yep uh I said we've I never a seen a saw movie together that's true we have never I'm... seen we've talked about them but we've never actually sat and watched i'm sorry that this was the one that we we had to watch together but you know I, at least we did that we we high-fived and uh it happened I'm I'm hoping that this is a one and done tradition. Mm. Um, at least, but if it's Halloween, saw. it must be Saw. I mean, that was kind of the the delight of it. I, although, I, much like you, I, I was I was kind of over the franchise by about Saw Five, Saw Six, but I was waiting for them to close it out because you know, as we as we know, Saw Four through Seven were envisioned as a full narrative arc. And what I've said, and I probably said before, was that there's about enough move, enough story for about a movie and a half, but they stretch it out over four movies. And I'm kind of like, so it, just, it started feeling a little thin by the end. Uh, but I remember being very impressed when, because I thought three was a great ending to a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And then when they said Saw 4, I was like, all right, I don't know how you're going to do that. And I love that they opened Saw 4 with the autopsy of Jigsaw as if to say, this guy ain't coming back. So guess what we're going to do? And I was like, okay, I'm on board because it was a very explicit autopsy, uh, very detailed. They're like, nope, he's dead. He's really dead. And they strung those storylines forward from supporting characters and pulled them forward and kind of retrofitted things onto the previous three. And I was like, I, I have such a grudging admiration for this series, it's like this is actually more effort than, say, most franchises put in. You know, most franchises are like, how do we bring him back and how many people can we kill and how can how spectacularly can he die at the end? Yeah, and I I'm a big fan of one through three. I think it's almost a perfect horror trilogy. I love that, four, you know, four is a what I call the paraquel where the big kind of reveal at the end is this was happening at the same time as some of those other movies, instead of right. like being a fourth film, you know, five through seven, they kind of have their charms. I certainly didn't like them when I first saw them, but then revisiting them to talk to you about them, I had a yeah. greater appreciation and, you know, whatever that was going on with jigsaw and then with spiral, it's sort of like the, you know, folks at Lionsgate and twisted pictures are like, okay, this thing, you know, diminishing returns all the way up to, I mean, Saw 3D, that was Saw 7. That's when, you know, you mm -hmm. jumped the shark. So they're trying to like get, you know, kind of creative and reinvented in some cases. And it just didn't work. Right. Um, but especially I think Tobin Bell is sort of the magic ingredient in a lot of ways. So this one has been hailed as a return to form. And mm. I would say that's definitely the case because this definitely, unlike the last two entries, feels very much like 
a saw film complete with the kind of the grittiness the traps tobin bell is very much in it because this movie takes place between as i understand saws two and three okay amanda's back um you know and it's but the problem is i feel like they even brought back the director of saw six kevin gruder to do this film um so it does feel like it fits in with that saw family the problem is and what what do we have new to say with the story of Jigsaw, especially going back in time, you know, 20 years or so? What new information are we learning about Jigsaw, about his mentality that we didn't piece together, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, hell, uh, from the other, you know, some of the other entries? And at the end of this film, was like, no, all of this stuff was said much better and uh, much less verbosely because this mm. movie is two hours long. The first hour is almost like a documentary about dealing with terminal cancer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. Literally there's one uh, it's, and it's, it's spoilers folks, but it, there's one fantasy sequence of John Kramer, Tobin Bell's character, imagining doing something to uh, an orderly at a hospital who he right. finds is like kind of creeping through someone's belongings. And that's the famous eyeball scene. It's on the poster and in the teasers yep. and stuff. But the rest of it is John Kramer has cancer. He finds what he believes to be this institute, the Peterson Institute, that can help uh, you know relieve his you know, miracle cures essentially. And they're they're constantly uh, being uh, they're outrunning the FDA and and all sorts of global medical organizations because of their unorthodox practices. Spoiler alert! And this was all pretty much given away in the trailers, which was unfortunate. Uh, mm. They're all scam artists. And so John Kramer decides to use his newly formed jigsaw powers to uh, torture and, and maim and pretty much kill all of these folks. Um, they it's taking elements from all the other Saw movies and putting them together like Saw 2 had a whole bunch of people in one kind of house location right. going through all these shops. This one is literally it's like Reservoir Dogs. It's one giant kind of warehouse floor with all the traps set up in different parts and all the characters aware that they are one by one going to have to go through these trials. Um, I realized, and this is the tease coming out of the theater, why this movie feels like it's six hours long. And that's <laughs> because after a certain point, we never leave these characters. And all most of the other Saw movies, and certainly the ones that work, there's right. a cutting back and forth between the people who are in the traps yep. and the cops or the family members, whoever, who are trying to figure out where these people are, when they are, you right. know, that kind of thing. But we never leave this and we need that break because otherwise it's just wallowing in people screaming at each other and, and human misery, which, yes, that's what these movies are for, kind <laughs> of. But, you know, it just doesn't it just feels more like a carnival ride that I wanted to get off of, you know, six movies ago. That is a great observation. I actually hadn't I hadn't figured that part out. But, yeah, uh, when we look at four through seven, particularly where we have the you know, trade-off between the agent and the detective and the cat and mouse that's going on there. Um, yes, that gives us, because it, what I felt like, and it was odd that, you know, like you go to a Saw movie to kind of watch the traps, but I felt like the traps were kind of getting in the way of my story. I'm like, I'd rather watch this this cat and mouse between the detective and the, the agent. You know, it's like, will they come to justice or, you know, will he be able to outrun? And I found that really interesting. And like, whenever we took time out for a, a you know, a, a trap sequence. I was kind of like, eh, yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> um, but this one, you're right. I mean, it it all takes place in one place at all. It's the first time that we see Jigsaw observing in real time these, you know, like he's always kind of like removed from it until, you know, like rightly so. He usually is not around except for obviously the first one where he's kind of there the whole time. There, there was one other one, and this was, I can't remember which one. It might have been three, but it was the guy, and I don't even remember what trap it was. I remember the actor's face, but it was like the flashback scene to when his wife was pregnant and she was at the clinic and a guy like runs past her and right, she gets right, squeezed right. in the door and miscarries. That guy, we see John Kramer like setting up the trap for him and like saying they're watching him. But you're right. There usually is. It's just the tape with the voice yeah. on it and maybe they're being watched which by is, cameras or whatever. Yeah. Which is the thing. Like he creates the tape and you're kind of like, why, why would he even bother doing that's there's a lot of, you know, fan service, which I suppose is to be expected, but there's, there's things that don't also like suddenly Amanda like brings down the, the, the puppet on the bike and you're just kind of like, 
why you know like all the you know all the accoutrement that has been associated with John Kramer back in his urban environment is suddenly transported down to Mexico. It's like you don't need it. And also, where does he get all? I mean, that's always been the thing. It's like, how does he create all the traps and stuff? And it's like, okay, he's an engineer and he's he's been planning this out in advance, but this is impromptu. He didn't know this was going to happen. And so suddenly, within you know, 12 hours, he's conjured up all of these traps, and you're just like, eh, you you're asking a lot of an audience to to buy into. Well, on top of that, um, you know. The implication is that the Peterson Institute has been rich, ripping off like fabulously wealthy, terminally ill people. It's kind of a genius plan. They <laughs> say, hey, you know, we have someone kind of pass along this you know, website. You go sign up and they're like, oh, yeah, we can help you. We'll be in Mexico you know, or Norway or whatever. Come meet us. We'll do the surgery. By the time they realize that they've been scammed, most of these people are already dead, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right, right, right. or they're or they're in on it. They're kind of like a part of this pyramid scheme. Um, so. You're right. But also John Kramer makes a big deal about how you really get the feeling that he spent his entire life savings on this treatment because he wants to live so badly. Mm -hmm. So to your point, how does he afford to to do all this stuff? There's uh, if you haven't if if you are not versed in Saw and maybe only saw the first one or the second one, you're like, oh, this is a bridge between two and three. It's still going to be very confusing because we see uh, Detective Hoffman who is the center point of five through seven, who kind of take tries to take over the Jigsaw legacy and he and Amanda like gonna go at it. I think I I it's very long since I remember, you know, or watched <laughs> these movies. But he's in the movie. But if you're only familiar with the first few, you're like, well, who the hell is this guy? And if you've seen all of the Saw movies, you're like, yeah, I know he was kind of around from the beginning, but that's sort of a mystery to be revealed and and figured out later but this movie doesn't really give you context for when or where this is really there's keys in some of the technology like you've got like the tube tvs when john kramer's on a computer it looks very like you know 2005 interface but then you go to dr peterson's office she has like this brand new giant flat screen tv on her wall i'm like (laughs) i don't even know where i'm at at anymore Yeah, it's and well, and I think we also want to speak to the elephant in the room is that, you know, we are 20 years on from the first Saw movie. And well, Tobin Bell and Shawnee Smith are 20 years older. And and this is supposed to we're supposed to, you know, buy into the fact that this is taking place between Saws two and three, which I guess is like 2006, 2007. Yeah, but. Even so, years ago, yeah, yeah. So even so, I guess it was 2020 that we did the Saw one, two, three, because we were because 2010 was when Saw the final chapter came out. But again, my point is like I'm looking at Tobin well, Tobin Bell, and it's like I'm glad you're still looking healthy, but you look older. And Shawnee Smith looks older, and I found that really distracting. And I was kind of like to get out of it what they wanted to get out of it. I don't know that it was worth it to bring back Shawnee Smith, to bring back Tobin Bell. I I'll give Tobin Bell a pass only because we're supposed to, I, th- I think like he's supposed to be like as cancer ridden as possible. I think sure. they just got him. He just looks old and haggard regularly. Just looks I, old. Yeah. I looked this up. He's 81 years old. That's unbelievable to me because yep. he gives a great performance. It's you a know, great performance. He's... Yeah, it's it's a wonderful, you know, he's a great actor and he does really well in this movie, you know, up to a certain point. And then the movie kind of gets in in the way of his performance. Yeah. Shawnee Smith, on the other hand, I really feel like they should have recast someone who was, you know, 32 or whatever her character was, because I look at her. She's wearing the same clothes pretty much in the same haircut as she did in Saw 2. But man, she uh, she's 54 and that's not a knock on her age. But no, there is she a just difference doesn't look between... like she's 30. Yeah. Right. And on top of that, she doesn't even act the way that she did in, you know, the earlier Saw films. There's something very robotic, very stiff. It's almost as if they would said, hey, come back for Saw 10. Great. When do we start filming? Tomorrow. Uh, OK, Amanda, who is she again? Um, there's I remember those performances, particularly in Saw's two and three. And she really has range she feels like a real person you, yeah. you kind of feel sympathy for her at, at the same time you're mad because she's making all these ter- terrible decisions 
in this one, she's just uh, she might as well just be called Igor. She's just kind of like slumping around and, and doing whatever. There's just no life in this film. The Dr. Yeah. Peterson character, the actress who played her, I think she was the, the most dynamic performer in the entire movie. And that's a real problem. Yeah, agreed. And I, I can't pronounce her name because there's all sorts of, you know, sh you know, schwas and circles with with slashes through them. But yeah. I also feel like she's she's the most mustache twirling villain we've had in a Saw movie. And like she just delights in how awful she is. And I think it's I mean, the fact that we've got some Mexican uh characters that are kind of the being puppeted by this evil white woman you know because the saw films have always been political and had got increasingly more political as the series went on mm -hmm. so i was you know i was keen on the fact that you know here we're going to take a shot at big pharma we're going to take a big we're going to take a shot at the medical industry overall i'm totally fine with that that's on brand but she's there's no there's not even any sense of her uh, trying to do right in any sense. She's just this evil, money-loving monster taking advantage and laughing gleefully to the bank. And I'm just kind of like, I would have preferred a little more nuance. I love the fact how ruthless she is. Like, she's the most fun person to watch, for sure. But it's very much a cartoon character in a... you know. And then you've got Tobin Bell turning in this really nuanced performance. And then you've got Shawnee Smith, as you said, kind of turning in this half performance. And then the other characters are just kind of there to scream. Right. I mean, I was thinking of there's elements of the first Hostel movie. Um, there was the character Gabriella, who you know, when John Kramer first comes to the the villa or whatever in Mexico to get the treatment, she's like the, the nice girl who opens the door and greets him, takes him around, gives him this you know tequila or something. And she looks, you know, very good. But then we see her later when she's off the clock, much like um, Barbara Nigel Neljakova's character in Hostel. She's, mm. you know, rugged and, you know, sweaty and just looks gross because she's a drug addict and everything. So there's that element of the the tourist kind of being taken advantage of, which yeah. is, you know, nice to see. But there's nothing really more to that until the end. And, you know, we're kind of talking spoilers here. Her character goes through the trap and she survives only to be literally having, you know, being stepped on by, as you say, the, the giant, you know, evil capitalist, you know, medical fraud, uh, our character, Dr. Peterson, you know, snaps yeah. her, or breaks her neck. Um, it's, it's sad, but there's nothing, there's no real catharsis, no point to it other than that kind of surface level reading. Whereas I feel like the earlier Saw movies really had something to say. Saw six, I think, said all of this because that was about a guy who ran an was an insur medical insurance company was constantly denying people and trying to find ways to screw them out of their policies or, or right. from paying and they went through the whole gamut of all these are all these medical professionals or whatever and we're gonna you know screw them over we're kind of doing the same thing like eight years later but right. without an eighth of the you know the point behind it well there's two other things that tell well, two other traps really uh we have John Kramer's thing is he's always testing to see how much you want to live. And we see two times where characters are willing to endure awful, awful things to try and save their lives. And they miss the clock by seconds. And I just go, that does, that makes me just feel like John Kramer's cruel and it doesn't, it, that's that doesn't feel as as on track. Now maybe there was other see, other traps in previous Saw movies where that sim, same thing happened, but it often felt like you know like there was just they're 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 penalized for delaying in you know doing whatever it is they needed to do, and and I feel like that that feels again it just feels mean. It feels cruel. It feels very Saw three where it's an unwinnable trap. Well, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm there with you. I, I understand what you're saying, but, and if I were more, I guess, more recently versed in the saw traps, I could probably argue, well, there was this case and that case, because yeah. I would like to think it'd be neat because this is sort of a prequel 
if he learned something like in the later saw films the traps were set for five minutes because he had to account for them to you know some freak out time or something right because you're right in two traps in particular i don't remember which ones they were because they all kind of run together but they they cut to the the red digital readout at i think 17 seconds like in both cases like that's the magic number and then it gets right. counts down down like oh they're not going to make it and that's kind of fine because <clears throat> i think after this after watching one person go through the trap and freak out and realize, oh, every sec, literally every second counts. If you're that person who's like, oh, I'm just going to sit here and freak out and, you know, but yeah, my life is on the line. Then you, not to say that anybody deserves this, but it's more understandable. It's like, yeah, just get to it, do the thing. Right. Um, I do remember in, and that was sort of, I think, Agent Hoffman's deal was he was sort of fidgeting with Jigsaw's formula and putting up some traps that, killed people regardless right. of you know they made it out but it still killed them and that was what sort of led to his uh, downfall yeah um and amanda as well i mean that's her saw th her, her saw three problems that she was creating unwinnable traps and jigsaw calls her and he's like you, you know you can't do that like they have to be able to win oh yeah you know that whole thing about the the surgeon that they brought in and he's like his life or your life is in her hands and you know I think about that. I think that's probably my favorite Saw movie because it's so complex and heartbreaking and just interesting because Jigsaw, <clears throat> that's where he bites the bullet and you watch <laughs> him die. And then just that aftermath of the, the guy realizing that he's trapped in there. And oh, man, I just want to yeah. watch Saw 3 again. Forget Saw 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Saw, Saw 10. I mean, I. It, I, I, I also didn't feel and I was I was trying to like was there a joy was there you know pleasure in watching the saw movies because i didn't feel any joy i didn't and we were watching it that that was the other thing i was like getting back to watching it with a crowd i was kind of looking forward to that but either the either the traps aren't gory enough or elaborate enough or shocking enough but there was like we were watching it in a completely silent theater it was just kind of like uh-huh 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 and i remember you know in saw two three four there was like ooh or ah because a the the traps were inventive and they were gory and you know kind of like gritty and nasty and you're like oh man i can feel what that would be like and in this one it's just kind of like it, either we just are so inured to it or they just really weren't that interesting I think it's a bit of both. I mean, because you talk about you know, Saw was sort of the one of the inciting incidents and the, the strong proponents or uh, flag bearers of the torture porn movement of the early 2000s, rightfully or right. wrong, however you want to apply that label. I think it's it, those films are a lot more than torture porn, although they I do agree. get more and more graphic. Like Saw 3, one of the things I love about it is it's so fascinating. When John Kramer is getting the brain surgery done, you feel like you're learning something while all of this gruesome stuff is happening. Yeah. And to the point of, you know, the audience kind of being checked out or whatever, what are what are the traps in here? There there was the one with the the wire saw where the girl's like sawing yeah, off yeah. her own leg. That was kind of nice. But then there's the other one where the guy has to put his brain matter into a cup. But still, that's like, okay, yeah, he's drilling in through the top of his skull. We saw that in the best of the saw movies and saw three. There is a repetitiveness to it that it's like maybe it's a cultural thing. Like what can shock us now? Whereas right. early, you know, 20 years ago, like, wow, I can't believe an R-rated movie can show us this. There was a sense of danger and the unexpected. On top of that, for me, one of the the ookiest moments was one of the, the tamer ones at the end of Saw 2, where the guy realizes he got the puzzle piece on the back of his neck. So he takes the knife and like carves it out of his own neck and looks at it. like that just that freaks me out because it's so <laughs> it's not the goriest thing but i can just imagine being in the room while someone does that and be like everybody has gone insane yeah yeah and you know and, and i think that is right what we what we did like about the saw movies was how elaborate is the next trap going to be how is this going to be set up and here kind of you know speaking to my point earlier they feel a little lower grade but they still feel higher grade to than to be believed like, I don't believe he just conjured that stuff within 12 hours. Right. The, the the sense of time gets all kind of weirded out. Plus, 
yeah, did he fly the the pig mask outfit down from you know the states, or did he just find a? Well, I mean, I'm assuming. I mean, I thought Amanda brought them with, but how did she get those through customs? I mean, on top of that, <laughs> Amanda is just she's fresh off being a junkie, and she's crazy. Like, I don't know. right, right. Um, but the other thing, I can't remember which saw this. This might have been three <clears throat> as well, but there was the judge. I think he was one of the guys in one of the traps, and it was like right. all the pig guts were being. Yep. Uh, or cow guts or whatever being liquefied and he was drowning and just that last scene of just his nose and his mouth peeking up from this it's just that fundamental fear of drowning and like <laughs> oh my god is this guy gonna be okay and i feel like it's me in that trap none of these traps did i ever feel like i was in danger of you know i'm never gonna have pipe bombs grafted to my arms with rebar and have probably to not. cut them out you know <laughs> probably not I, I i mean i i did think that our our seesaw uh trap was interesting in in a you know in, a, in terms of a dramatic sense of them not wanting to kill one another you know like like i i thought that was interesting it's about the most interesting thing I could remember, though. You know, the fact that that the fact that, like, you know, they're they're choosing not to kill each other. I guess. But and this is what Jigsaw is, you know, the tables are turned on him as Dr. Peterson. And it turns out one of the former patients who was not a patient, he was in on it with her and they're he they're trying to scam all these people together. But he's probably going to get double crossed or triple crossed, whatever, by her. They team up, they grab a gun, they take Amanda and Jigsaw hostage. They get this little, was it Carlos was the little boy? I think so. Yeah. This little boy, Carlos, is like playing ball outside. They lure him into the the torture dungeon and they strap him to this seesaw with Jigsaw on the other end. And they're being doused in blood and it's like blood boarding, as she called it. Yeah. You know, very 2000, you know, that 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 is one of the most authentic to the time pieces of <laughs> you know, dialogue there, because that was all about the Iraq war and waterboarding and stuff. Right. But this is literally like the third act, like right before the movie's over, we introduce this kid. And I'm like, are they going to kill the kid? I don't feel like this movie is bold enough to do that, because I uh -huh. think that'd be kind of crossing a Rubicon. But on the other hand, I kept thinking, if this kid survives, where was he for the other Saw movies? How does he fit into this? Oh my God, no, they're setting this up for a new trilogy and it's going to be the saga of Carlos, which I don't <laughs> need in my life. Well, okay. Now you just actually brought up something else that's a bit of a quibble in that, well, we know John Kramer ain't going to die. You know, like this is set between two and three. So where's the dramatic tension in? It's like, well, we know he's going to make it out. There's and it's not that, well, it's James Bond, so we know he's going to live or we know it's Tom Cruise, so he's going to live or we know it's Captain Kirk. So he knows it's it's Jigsaw. And we're kind of like, he's not going to die because we know he's not going to die. We already know that this is a prequel to the movie in which we see him die. I think that's an excellent point. And that may be along with the whole lack of cutting back to outside you know forces that is the thing that I think stuck in my craw. I couldn't articulate it or even really understand until you brought it up. I was coming into this movie, and we got this in the first 45 minutes. If this is a prequel, mm -hmm. because the guy's dead, you can't make a sequel unless he's a ghost. What is John Kramer learning in the course of this movie that is going to inform the right. rest of the series? I feel like there should be some giant aha moment or some big you know maybe john kramer is the victim of his own twist you know that they've always got the moment at the end where the the da -na -na, da -na 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 -na, yep. you know the montage wouldn't it be great if you know when dr peterson turned the tables on him he had one of those moments you're like oh my god jigsaw is screwed i don't know how he's going to get out of this but i know he kind of has to because he's in the other movies but it really looks like he's not going to be okay yeah and they don't do that really well and 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 what is great about those other movies is that we do see it inform like the later sequels again right or wrong the fact that they stretch that story so thin it always does tie back in tie back in really the only thing that ties in here is shawnee smith you know that's really the only connective tissue we have between this movie and the other movies right and even at the end but not know, anything narratively Right. But 
at the end when there's a mid credit sequence where we see Hoffman and Jigsaw with Michael Beach's character. And he was the person that kind of scammed John Kramer right. into going to Mexico in the first place. Like, oh, I had my surgery, too. I had this scar. It works wonders. And he's got a weird, like, stomach scraping torture device set up. And I'm like, all right, what am I? How, to your point, how does this tie into yeah. anything else? Except maybe we'll see this character in Saw 13. Like, oh, remember that guy? Like, no, because I don't care. Well, and also, I mean, the way they show that Michael Beach character, it's not a trap. It's just an elaborate way to murder him. As far as we see, I mean, maybe we'll come back and they. There's no the game thing involved. I mean, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. It's, damn it. <laughs> I was trying to give it the benefit of the doubt. And now I just doubt there's any benefit. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it was, it was, it, again, it felt a little, bringing back uh, a, a Detective Hoffman just feels like more fan service and, you know, good on Costas Mandalore for, you know, looking the same as he did 10 years ago. But I'm just kind of like, eh. Well, on top of that, it feels like it's supposed to be a big audience moment. Like, oh, there's the guy. But earlier on in the film, we see Jigsaw on the phone. He's like, yes, I need to speak to this. I can't remember if he said it was an officer or person at whatever desk. I'm like, oh, he's right. calling Detective Hoffman. Right. Because I paid attention to these other movies. But it doesn't it doesn't add up to anything. Well, and also, I'm sorry, but Detective Hoffman was never an interesting character. <laughs> Like Costas Mandula, not an interesting actor. And I'm kind of like, I uh, trust me, I wasn't waiting to see more Detective Hoffman. I was not like, oh, thank God he's back. Now we got something. Yeah, it was it was it was frustrating. And as you have said numerous times, it doesn't need to be this long. You know, like there's there's not that much story to tell. I did enjoy the character study of John Kramer, and I liked seeing Tobin Bell being given the opportunity to do more than just sit and you know whisper into into the into the the, the mic but I'm just kind of like ah oh, man I, I wish he'd had a better story to hang it on yeah very well said um i hate to rag on this movie because a lot of people seem to love it but uh yeah i i wonder if a lot of it is just the enthusiasm because a it's not the nun two so <laughs> that movie has been dethroned although this one came in second to paw patrol so you can have that <laughs> meme of saw patrol which i fully support um but uh yeah they, they just might be excited by this return to form but i think once this hits week two or home video people are like eh, that's my yeah. prediction i can't but, imagine um, anybody's going to be looking back on this and going you know what my favorite saw is is saw 10 unlike say jason x where i'm like that movie's awesome it really is. They need. And if a, they had uh, fully jumped, maybe if they had fully jumped the shark and had Jigsaw in space, then it would have been something fun. Or do something really crazy and make this a sequel to the other Saw movies where someone Herbert West style finds a way to reanimate John <laughs> Kramer and bring him back from the dead because they believe in his cause. Yeah, it's crazy. It's the Jason X of the Saw ideas. But if you're going to have Saw X, make it like Jason X. Very well done, sir. Yeah, great. Um, so AC briefly, because I know we're on the Zoom clock here and That's I'm loving right. it because we've had no technical difficulties as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, let me know. Uh, let us know what's going on with this month of October. Give us well, your scarathon pitch because it's happening. Uh, well, yes. And we are we are into October now. And uh we're going to be doing 31 movies in 31 days every night on the Horror 101 with Dr. AC YouTube channel uh, every night at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Tune in. Uh, we are benefiting the Women's Reproductive Rights Assistance Project, uh, a.k.a. RAP. So uh, the uh, link to donate is below in the description of every one of those videos. So please you know, follow along with us 31 days and and 31 nights of 31 movies, 31 sharing the scare, and we're going to try and raise a ton of money for a very worthy cause. And and thank you, Ian, for, again, all of your support over the years. Of course. Uh, this is one of my favorite things that, that I get to to help out with each year, and, and it's a blast. <laughs> and this year is going to be no exception because everybody, as you say, loves a sequel. All right, except for except for Saw Ten, I <laughs> neither of us didn't love this particular sequel. No, so I guess uh, we'll be talking again uh, probably next October about Saw Eleven. 
Yay. For sure. <laughs> Yay. Consistency. Love it. All right, sir. Thank you very much, everybody out there. Check out AC's stuff. Support the Scarathon. Support Rap. Um, if you like this show, uh, please give it a like and a subscribe and put on the bell for notifications. All that great stuff. Put on the Tobin bell for notifications. Oh, we love, we love him. Um, and uh, yeah, till next time, whenever that is, whatever that is. Thank you very much. Take care and uh, happy spooky season. <laughs>